Howdy. Aaron Boster here with the Ohio Health MS Center. I put forth a uh, Twitter poll recently asking folks uh, topics they'd like me to speak about. And even though the poll is still going, uh, over 60% of people uh, all wanted to hear about when to switch MS drugs. So I thought I would take a few minutes uh, and discuss just that. Uh, when to switch an MS therapeutic. Now this is a very, very uh, important uh, discussion, I feel. And I think it's uh, all too often not paid adequate attention to. Um, I, I think that there are certain times when we, we need to divorce ourselves of a given therapy and move on to something else. And I typically frame this with my patients by telling them that we're dating our MS therapy. We're not marrying our MS therapy. And as long as the MS therapy uh, that we're dating is being a gentleman uh, and being respectful and wonderful, then we're going to remain in this, in this dating relationship. But if he starts to misbehave, maybe uh, uh, goes out with some other gal, uh, or is no longer polite and pushes in your chair, or something else along those lines. Well, in this situation, we, we may have to delete him out of your phone and take him off Facebook um, and, and tell him, look, it's not you, it's me, I'm going through something right now and I'll call you later, and then never call him later. In other words, break up. So, so when would we need to break up with a drug? I really think of five, uh, five reasons. The first time that I'm gonna consider uh, breaking up with a drug is if while on therapy, the patient has an MS attack. Now, the caveat is they have to be on the therapy long enough that we think it started to work, all right? And the other caveat is they have to actually take the therapy. And so those are different problems. But presuming that the patient's been on therapy adequately long, and presuming that they've been taking it uh, adherently, and they have an attack, that's grounds for discussing switching a therapy, number one. Number two, is also a clinical parameter, but it's not as hard and fast as, as an attack, and that's failing the litmus test of life. All too often, a patient will come into my office and they'll say, you're gonna tell me I'm okay and I'm not. And then they will describe to me a life event that they are no longer able to do, something like catching a softball or walking uh, in the woods. And, and they'll say, well, you know, your exam won't show that and I haven't had an attack, so I must be okay, but I'm not doing well. And the answer is, you're right, you're not doing well. And if you're on an MS medicine while you're failing a litmus test of life, it makes me want to look critically at that medicine and consider a different option. Now, the third parameter would be on the MRI. We now have very, very strong evidence that if you're taking an MS therapy and you have new spots on your MRI, you're unlikely to do well on that therapy. And so if you're on therapy and we get a routine MRI, I like to get MRIs in my relapsing patients about once annually. And I'm not getting an MRI because they're not doing well. On the contrary, I'm trying to look for subclinical disease. Um, I use an analogy of like a mechanic with a car. I take my car into the mechanic once a year, and he checks it out, and he may call me and say, hey man, your left front brake pad's about to give out in maybe, maybe a month or two. I say, well, I didn't know that my front left brake pad was problematic, it doesn't feel bad. And he said, of course it doesn't feel bad. You're not gonna notice it until it gives out and you go skidding across the road and smash into something. And so he says, well, I'm gonna fix your front left brake pad, and that way we never experience that. So in this analogy, the, the mechanic, he's identified a subclinical problem with my car and he's fixing it before it becomes a clinical problem. In a similar fashion, if you look good and you feel good on your MS medicine and we get an MRI and see that you have new spots, you're not gonna do good. It's subclinical disease activity and it tells us that you're not fully responding to that therapy and that's rationale for making a change or at least talking about one. Now, the fourth category is intolerable side effects or uncomfortable safety profile. All MS medicines have a side effect profile unique to their own, and a patient uh, may over time become uncomfortable. I'll give you an example of someone that's tolerating um, an injection for the first seven years, but after injecting a couple times a week for seven years, they become sick and tired of injecting, and they start to become maybe not adherent. They, they, they're having increasing difficulties in doing the injections. That's a rationale to talk about another option. Safety concerns and tolerability concerns are dynamic, and something that doesn't bother a patient one moment in time may become uh, unacceptable down the road. And so uh, this is another reason why we might consider leaving a therapy. The fifth reason is the most troublesome in my head, and that's for uh, progression. When a patient has progression of disease, when I identify that their neurological exam is worsening, that they uh, have a new hitch in their giddy-up or, or that they're, they're now having problems with balance. I, I want to discuss changing drugs, but to be completely transparent with the patient, I have to tell them it's not a guaranteed conclusion that we're going to be able to affect this. From where I sit, 
we know that if we don't change, this is what we're going to get. And there are times that we may discuss making a switch in hopes that we gain more, knowing that we won't know until we try. So once again, my name is Aaron Boster with the Ohio Health MS Center, uh, talking to you today about when we would switch drugs uh, in the MS realm. Thank you so much. Have a great day.